Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Darren Bresnitz. We are so excited to be sitting down with Emily Afromov, the chef and owner of Little Dasha. It's a pop-up in LA that started last year focusing on Russian and Circassian food. We talk about kachapori. We talk about her grandmother's influence on her food. We talk about her mother pulling over on the New Jersey Turnpike to forage for mushrooms, her getting into the New York nightlife scene at a young age, and her eventual move to LA and the start of the pop-up. It's a great conversation. We talk a lot about food. We talk a lot about just believing in yourself. It's a, it's a great, great, great chat, and we think you'll enjoy it. And then we dig into the archives, a little throwback to the Boston duo that we love so, so much, Crush Club. We get a little funk. We get a little dance. It's a lot of fun. And uh, just a bit of a nod to Emily's time in Brooklyn. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky Tunes.
Emily, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to sit down and chat with us about little Dasha and your life. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. We're so happy that you're here with us today. It's great to be here. So, you know, I grew up going to Coney Island, Sheepshead Bay. Ha- Russian food was like a huge part of my life to the point where I didn't realize that other people didn't know about Russian food. And so with your pop-up starting in LA uh, last year, are you maybe the first time that people are having Russian and Circassian food? Do, you, do people come to you and be like, I never knew what this was. And and I saw you on Instagram and I thought I'd come eat with you. And it's like, oh my God, there's a whole new world and you're my guide to it. <laughs> I mean, for sure. It's it's something that it's, it's almost like hard to even relate in some kind of standpoint, right? Because it, it's, it was so close to something that I just grew up around. Sure. And you know, my grandma, like, would just kind of, you know, she she immigrated here to kind of take care of me. And mm. uh, being, I mean, it was just, it was just, a, it was just eating things like simple, but mm-hmm. complex and evoking that sense of hospitality is really how everything sort of started with me. Um, mm. I mean, you know, we like coming home and eating like these like mashed potatoes and dill pickles and like these insane soups of like mm. filled hearts and gizzards or fish head. Um, and then like whenever we'd have guests over, it's like insane spread mezze. Yes. With, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with super labor intensive dishes. I mean, especially because you're kind of cooking off of, you know, like a one pan kind of thing. I mean, if you're making yep. about like baroshkis or blinchiki. You know, um, it was always a lot of labor of love, I would like to say. And yeah, seeing that kind of brought a, brought a lot. It's um, it's so amazing that you – I don't want to say take it for granted. I know in ways that some – some ways that I did. My grandmother's Hungarian on my dad's side and we had a similar type of food and there was always be so much of it. And you just think that like that's how most people are eating, um, but you know it's 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 you know when when as a kid did you realize that like food was such a big part of your life and that that wasn't going on in other houses and did you em- embrace it or oh was there was there a rejection that was like I just want Wonder Bread and give me some sliced ham? Oh my god! I my I would oh my god I. <laughs> I'd, be, <laughs> I'd be like in elementary school and getting like these yeah. like super, super crazy weird salami sandwiches, you know, like uh-huh. and just like embarrassing pickles and would feel so just black sheep, right? Mm-hmm. Like, where I had, like the, the classic Lunchables, which like I crave so much, which are sure. <laughs> um, but it, you know, I mean, it, it's one of those things. Like, I mean, as far as just even from the standpoint from a hospitality kind of, um, like, the, the giving af- aspect of everything and seeing just how guests were treated. I mean, 
you were just, you were totally fucked. I mean, like you show up, you come <laughs> as a guest and you are undoubtedly fucked with food. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess it's just, it's just one of those things where it subconsciously, it made me realize from the beginning, but at the same mm. time, um, you know, like my grandma didn't even come into my life until a little bit later to start taking sure. care of me. And, you know, like my first memories with food were really just like paging through cookbooks and just somehow kind of gravitated to that. Um, you know, like my mom from Moscow, you know, she'd like do this like crazy thing, just like literally stop on the highway while we're driving <laughs> and <laughs> to, to forage mushrooms. Oh I my mean, God. <laughs> I mean, um, so yeah, it's a weird, it's a, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Yeah. It's like, it's like you guys know when you're on the Jersey Turnpike and your mother pulls over to get mushrooms <laughs> that then go into uh, pickling liquid and it's served to you at lunch. You guys have that similar experience and everyone at the lunch table is like, uh, Emily, what, like, what is that? <laughs> what is, what is, I, I know the food comes from the supermarket. Um, but yeah, there, there is that like built in hospitality, like open door policy, especially I, I think for people who are immigrants or, or children or grandchildren of immigrants where there's that warmth through food and through cooking that, um, it's interesting cause, um, there's a through line that you experience that I feel like I experienced well um, in New York nightlife where it's like you go out and you meet this community and there's like these open doors and like there's like this whole thing where you go out to dance and you go out to eat and you're like, oh, like this is sort of the same feeling I got at home, but like with my New York family. And I know that you would go into the city as a young kid and that was really influential um, on your your outlook on life. Uh, how did What drew you to it and why did it, why was it such a big impact? Yeah, I mean – I was a really bad kid. <laughs> mm, go on. Give me a story. Give, give me one story. Just one story. <laughs> I mean, it just, they were, I mean, growing up in somewhere like Fort Lee, New Jersey, that, yeah. I mean, literally my high school was about a five minute walk from, from the bridge. So dangerous. Just, yeah. Pretty, pretty. It was just, it was so accessible. And, um, I mean, I would, you know, I, I literally was that kid that would just like show up with a bunch of like baked goods and cupcakes in the morning and then mm -hmm. kind of like, tap out in <laughs> homeroom and cut class and just literally go into the city, run mm -hmm. around. Um, so that was sort of like the setting point of kind of getting, I guess, immersed in the entire scene. Um, yeah, I mean, the impact, <laughs> it's like, it's one of those things where I was so young mm -hmm. and having the fact of, I mean, looking back now, it's it's just, it's like, whoa, you know, but being like snuck into, you know, kitchens through supper clubs and just like being in that scene and like the dive bars, the, all the warehouse parties, the music venues and having this like level of innocence mm -hmm. where you don't even know exactly what you're being mm. exposed to, but later down the line, you realize just how much of that influence it really is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're like, Oh, this is why I do this. This is why I'm drawn to, to, to the pace of it. I mean that, you know, you paid through some cookbooks, you go on to New York nightlife and it's, it's no wonder how you wound up working in the food world. It's like the, the one, two punch that gets you in, into that, that whole scene. It was completely transcending. I mean, just even the fact that I almost, I almost see them as reels in this like weird way. I mean, especially growing up in that, you know, like that metropolitan like area is just, you kind of, you, you like walk, you, you're walking around and you like plug yourself in with headphones and mm -hmm. you're just, you're seeing just like atmosphere after atmosphere and like the amount of diversity that's like within that city alone, you know, it's just, um, for sure, for sure. And 
yeah, I mean, you start to kind of like, once I kind of really delved into like all the different scenes, and that's another thing as well. I, I, I'm lucky to be able to say that I was exposed to lots of different subcultures. Mm. Um, you know, you have like the clubs, you have the like super punk, you know, warehouse parties, whatever venues. Um, I was a little bit of a, of a, a butterfly in a lot of ways. Sure. And just seeing every single aspect of what that even was. I mean, like the inspiration for even hospitality. I mean, there's this one particular night that it was my friend. It was like a friend of a friend. Um, and it was like, there's this weird house dinner thing. If you want to go, it was in Red Hook back then. Which- Love it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I know those. I know those Red Hook warehouse parties too well. <laughs> so then you also know that, like, it was a thirty-minute walk from the subway, even to even get close to the river. People, um, people tend to forget that, like, Red Hook used to be like the end of the world in in Brooklyn. <laughs> For sure, yeah. <laughs> and now we look at Williamsburg and we're like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so you're at a warehouse dinner party. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was just like walking into that that space. Like you walk up this like super janky ass elevator and mm-hmm. stepping into this just massive raw space. It was a wrap with like a ton of posters. The music was blasting. There was like candlelit and this one communal setup setup of a table. Um, and I just remember just the feeling associated with it and it just kind of clicked and I was like, I want to do that. (laughs) You know, like (laughs) I want to pursue cooking and, and everything that had around her. So it's just that, that energy and that atmosphere. Mm. um, And I think, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's interesting though, because you hear that and I'm like, Oh, she went and started cooking, but the, your first dabbles or some of your forays into the food world was through the media side, Bon Appetit, Epicurious. What drew you to that part of the culinary world first? Um, Like going into Bon Appetit, like into the media world? Yeah, because a lot of times you hear people going the opposite way. Like, oh, I was a line cook and then I just, I was like, I got to get out of this. So I went to go work at uh, a magazine or, or a media conglomerate. You st- you, your big foray, or at least it's f- your formative, it seems like we're at these uh, magazines and not the other way around. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, like my family was never supportive or over anything around pursuing mm. the industry. Uh, I was originally set, you know, like throughout this entire just plethora of in New York City like experiencing everything I experienced, I kind of found myself a little bit drawn to pastry arts, which is kind of funny. Mm. Um, and, you know, like my, my stepfather, who's from Ukraine, uh, he, he passed away and it sort of just completely renavigated everything. And yeah. I ended up going to a school uh, with commuter, like for, for marketing, you know, like my mom was in a bad place like I was in a bad place. It was just, it just seemed like the way to go. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just, it was, it was difficult in the sense that I kept trying to pursue being in the field over and over again. Um, you know, was working in front of house and restaurants. Yeah doing like the corporate jobs and I just like I could not find an inch way and then by some chance you know found myself at Bon Appetit and at that time it's it just all added up in a lot of ways I mean sure I was completely drained from drugs and alcohol and just like completely needing to have some kind of fresh start and seeing everything that was happening in LA at that time, especially, I mean, LA didn't really have 
culinary scene. What year was this? Oh my god, it was two, yeah, maybe like I think 2016, 2015. Yeah, uh, yeah, yep, go on. It was just, it was just, it like it just it was started. Just, to it was just popping. Exactly. On a national, on a national level. Right. 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 Um, yeah. And I mean, I like, I, I don't know. I just, I felt like I needed to start over. I bought a one-way ticket like a week before I got here. And, um, I (laughs) pretty much told everybody that, you know, yeah, sure. I'll be, I'll be back in a month. Right. (laughs) But (laughs) But you know, you know, (laughs) I know. Sometimes. Sometimes you just got a New York goodbye the whole city. You just got a New York exit on the way out. Um, I miss the pizza, though. I mean, that's... Uh, there, there's... Uh, well, we'll get into that. There's there's decent enough pizza here. Um, all right, let's take a quick musical break. Yeah. And then I want to get into your cooking adventures in LA and the, uh, the road to opening up Little Dasha. We have a song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on hrn.org. Taunting me made me feel some kind of way. See, I could keep my hands real clean, but then I'd never be. And so I try to tell myself I was born free. You know, we got so good. Oh, just so long. Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are with Emily Efremov. How'd I do? I feel like I got one one of the versions of the pronunciations. I know you said there's a few. It's so great. I feel like I, thank you. Um, so you've uh, New York exited goodbye the entire city. Everyone thinks you're coming back. You know that the ticket is one way. And the LA food scene is starting to really pop and you wind up at some of the city's biggest heavy hitters, Annual and Hatchet Hall, which is like these bold flavors, full animal, but in many ways uh, unapologetic about the cuisine, 
in the same way that maybe the cuisine that you grew up with was. What mm-hmm. drew you to those kitchens? What was your experience like working there? And um, what did you take away from working with those chefs? Yeah. Um, I, when I, I knew very few people when I moved out here. I mean, it was friends of friends. Um, I had this one, uh, this one or two friends actually um, back from the East Coast that kind of like let me get my, you know, just be able to like stay at their place while I got myself settled. Um, I was introduced to somebody that also came from Russian descent who happened to be bartending at Old Man Bar at Hatchet Hall. And I remember just walking into that space for the first time and just thinking in my head. And I, I'm just, I just got here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, so um, and just thinking I, I, everything about the energy, the atmosphere, the food, um, there was this like private, you know, there's that they have a, a private dining setup and that's kind of where we were situated with a bunch of friends sure. and that whole experience just, just blew me away in a lot of ways. And I said to myself that, okay, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I will work here. Like it was not even like a thing. <laughs> I'm going to work here. <laughs> and I, I was asking for a job for close to three years. Um, I was wow. reaching out to Martin Drellock, who, you know, is an absolutely incredible chef and also an incredible mentor. And um, finally, <laughs> he, you know, he, he brought me on board. Um, but prior, prior to that, you know, I was cooking at Lunetta and then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like having the experience of, of working at, animal too. I mean, I, I can't, I can't say anything aside from the fact of just how, how much I learned. I mean, coming from a place too, where I would primarily was working front of house and, you know, in like a food media, in like a restaurant marketing, Mm. like here, that was my day job. And then I, right after my day job, I would just go and cook in kitchens at night kind of thing. And, you know, it was, there was a, there's a thing sometimes where like people will tell you like work in a kitchen first. If you, if you know, if this is like for you, but I always yeah. want it. And mm. the chance that I'd lose within that space, I just kind of realized this is the direction to go. Hmm. That's, uh, that confidence is great. Um, (laughs) but with that desire to know that you always want to work in a kitchen, did the same confidence come with cooking and making food from your heritage, this Russian and Circassian food? Did you know that you want to serve that to people or what did that come later like after your experiences in the world saying that this is where i want to plant my my culinary flag Mm. um i remember like shortly before i moved out here i was like just looking through photos of my mom when she was like really young i mean Mm -hmm. she's and come across this this one photo that I don't know. It, it brought it brought some sense of nostalgia where I almost felt like whatever that photo was that I was also her, and it just inspired the sense of many many generations and the complexity the complexities over just like who she was and and then also like with food of like what does this what is this, what is this cuisine? I mean, you're mm-hmm. talking about like the ex Soviet union that consists of so many different countries. Right. And, um, that was, that was the initial. So when I, when I came here, you know, I had <clears throat> sort of like the, the idea of like starting over and breaking into the industry. Um, 
it was like it was set on those goals over okay like i'm gonna i'm gonna get into like a niche marketing like restaurant marketing i'm gonna start cooking in kitchens and i'm gonna start dacha and mm. that, it was <laughs> it was those three things you know um yeah and the road to actually starting the dasha is one of like insane pandemic perseverance yeah because it's just like what you put into it could you share a little bit about how it got started and the tenacity you just threw into it to keep it going yeah um when when the pandemic broke out you know i i had arrangements to basically be out of the place that i was living at and it was it was such an unknown time and obviously you know i lost both of my jobs and yeah. trying to just figure out like what to do next i mean for me it was just there was there was no way for me to kind of go back home. I mean, I'd I'd get calls like all the time. It was like, "What are you doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? You know, like like you're ruining your life, <laughs> like the whole gamut." Um, and I just I don't know. I mean, I was I was so perseverant over this like this journey with food and. Mm. Um, yeah, I kind of, I just, I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to pack everything, go to the desert. Um, you know, I, within those 16 months, I lived in eight different places. I had wow. everything in my car. I mean, I got pulled over like twice because they thought I was homeless, you know, because <laughs> it was, I mean, it was, but that, that initial, um, beginning in the desert kind of set the foundation I think mentally of going into dacha I mean like the idea was always there I came here with wanting to per to pursue it but I think in a lot of ways I, I found myself in a place where I was like all right like you're you're gonna you're gonna do it there's um and yeah I mean I I kind of like roamed around for a little bit. It found some temporary stability. And out of that place, my gosh, I mean, I was taking orders and I had this like super, super old love. Oh my God, this oven. I mean, it would break, <laughs> <laughs> it'd break down on me at all the time. <laughs> it was like one of those like really old vintage ones, you know? Sure, 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 sure. Um, Looks great. You love it. Doesn't love you back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I did, you know, it was a love hate relationship. I'd like, to of say. course, of <laughs> course, of course. Sometimes, sometimes you're like we can do this together. And you're like, all right, Emily, tonight for you, for you, <laughs> the kachapori is coming out hot for you. <laughs> Please work. <laughs> Please <Yeah>. work. Um, <laughs> and so you have the seven, and you were doing it like it's sort of a like a pickup and delivery, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a it, yeah, it was a pickup and deliver kind of delivery kind of setup, and um, I mean even that place like I I lost that place midway, and then had to pretty much like things were picking up quite a bit, and I oh my gosh, I mean I had um a really dear friend that let me kind of just like stay at their place and like little, little did they know that I would completely overtake their, <laughs> their backyard space <laughs> with this pizza oven and like, you know, like having like the spice cabinet literally in the trunk of my car with all of my things and, you know, just operated like that for quite a while um, until I was able to find, you know, a place to live basically. And now that you have the place to live, you've transitioned to, um, a more physical pop-up. Where is that? What's the support and what's the response been like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like the reason I started Kachapuri's was because the circumstances that I was in, uh, it was something that made sense feasibly, but it was never, like it was an introductory, right? Mm. I mean, so because 
takeout is kind of a rough, it's a, it's a rough dynamic to work around. <laughs> um, you know, um, you're not getting the same sort of quality product. And I think for me, now having a little bit more of a freedom in terms of the food that I'm cooking, like the pig head, you know, like the dumplings and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pasta roots. And um, yeah, it's given a little bit more of a foundation. I love it. So what's next? What's, what's the, you had those three goals. What's your next three goals? What's, what's the future look like for, for you and little Dasha? I have no idea. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much. No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <it's done. laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm taking it like, I think within this like pop-up dynamic and scene, sure. it's, it's, you know, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I also don't think it's kind of a, you know, we're all, we all kind of just found ourselves in this situation because we really, really wanted to do it. And, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of just, I mean, the core of it is like, I'm just super excited to be able to cook for people. I mean, when, when someone is just, just says to you and like, you're setting up on, on a street, you know, like, and just serving food <laughs> and someone is like, fuck, that was seriously delicious yeah uh, it's a really humbling feeling and i'm just excited just to to share like something that's so close to me and it's kind of also relative to just even with like food and music intertwined right i mean there's this piece of yourself you know like this like small piece of yourself whether it be equivalent to just like one dish or a different dish that you share and I don't know. It's, 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 it comes from a really subconscious space. It's a, it's a great feeling. I love it. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, before I let you go, you did put together a playlist for us. Can you explain the playlist that you threw together for us? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, Gosh, I mean, growing growing up, like the initial of just like a lot of these like bands, like you know Sonic Youth and Joy Division, uh, Bikini Kill, The Cure. Um, my God, I, I mean, I could go on, but that was a lot of what like my living on the East Coast kind of thing situation was like. But I mean, I'd go to a ton of different venues and like lots of like Lower East Side bars. You know, welcome to the Johnsons. I mean, I know you're from. I mean, of course. I, mean, <laughs> of course. I, I, I can't. T I actually legally can no longer talk about how much time I spent there due to my my own breakup uh, with New York. But yes, yes, I'm familiar <laughs> with uh, Paps Blue Ribbon is what I PBR as the kids say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it was the best bar. Like there was no light yeah. <laughs> ever. It was. Um, it it yeah. was. It was a time that, that I'm happy to see that indie sleaze come back very hard these days. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just a lot of, it was a lot of that. I mean, like going to a bunch of um, venues of like death by audio, if you know it. Um, I, yeah. I, I feel like we must've been in the same room. Cause I left New York in yeah. 2015 and you're literally just saying, Hey Darren, these are all the places you hung out. So <laughs> this is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, the playlist, like I love fuzz of any, like just fuzz period. Sure. Right. Like the pedals, the whole, the whole dynamic. And I mean, there's equivalent to this idea of finding yourself in a trance when you're mm. so immersed with and like present with cooking. And then it's the same thing with music. And when those two kind of come together, uh, yeah, I mean, the music is, is pretty much, like bands like I mean that's the thing like the bands that are on that playlist are kind of like a range between like something that you know it was I think it was like 2014 kind of more of an era so like post um Death Lens Thick that come from New York State um Idols Fiddler mm -hmm. and oh. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. All, all of it all of it all, um all of it. Well, well we'll make sure to include a link uh, on the show page for anyone who wants to get in 
and, and time travel a little bit. Um, <laughs> if people want to follow along, uh, check out the next pop up. Where can they go? How can they get in touch? Sure, it's little Dasha on on that Insta. Mm, shout out to Insta. The, <laughs> the, they really they really understand us, don't they? Um, <laughs> well, listen, Emily, congratulations. Uh, it's so awesome. Very close to my heart. Uh, this type of food it's it's like it's like going home again um and thank you for making the time with us we really appreciate it thank you so much awesome well we have another song from the archives and then a performance from the archives by crush club here on snacky tunes on heritage radio network.org <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome back. Crush Club, live in Studio TC in the Chev. 
Hello. Yay! Ah, <laughs> th- you're the only one. It's like a. It's kind of a like a name, Leshev. Yeah. Uh, that's been around for a while, and sometimes you know you pick a name for yourself, and you're like, man, it's like goofy. You know, after it's like a word that you just say over and over and over again, and after a while, it doesn't mean anything to you. And so I'm so glad you said it. And you said it right, and well, it's just nice. E- well, we've known each other for a long time. I know. So yeah. lots I, of emails. You lots. know, actually. Well, I mean, bef- prior to Crush Club. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah, yeah. Sweaty yeah. house parties in Brooklyn yeah. with Alex Pasternak. Of Y'all Lemonade. dated, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm all, well, this, I mean, the sun's still up, and we're listening to sun's funk. Hey. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And hey. disco and grooves. Yeah. I just texted my brother. This sounds like stuff we listened to when we were out. Yeah. 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 Right. Which is great. Feels right. Feels right. I'd say definitely one of the motivating factors of Crush Club is like, that's what you want. Just do that. Yeah. I'm not like, um, I'd say we're not really going uh, head to head with FKA Twigs on this project. We're having like a really amazing funk time. I remember yeah. all uh, smells. I remember when <laughs> yeah. I was at the end of DJing, it was when like, you know And you're still four, you're DJing right now. Kind of but okay, when yeah. like four by four right. and heavy bass is coming out right. and I was like, yeah, Oh, yeah. I'm gonna have to stop because I just don't like this. I, and, I, yeah. and, and I'm not and I'm not gonna and no one wants to hear the music I like anymore, so I guess I'm done. And there are some people who are just like, you know, DJ with the times and right. yeah. so it's like you can always tell when people like because I mean um, watching you two perform, it's like it could be two or two hundred or two thousand, and I and I'm totally. pretty sure it's the same performance, yeah, which yeah. means that you love it. Oh yeah, yeah, deep yeah, in yeah, the yeah. core. A, if it, if it's you know 100 BC, this is the same, even if we went back in time. Back in time. Well, probably probably <laughs> less amplified. Oh uh, yeah, more just <laughs> no. We find the Colosseum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sound bounces off the walls. It, it really does. Um, there there are a few words that I continue to see how Crush Club is defined: bold, sexy, oh, oh, reckless, yeah. instincts, body, anticipation. Mm-hmm. That just came from the chef's tender. Move, mm. Movement. <laughs> um, movement. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, that's. I, and I, but I can say it because. You know, you move, but you, you were giving great bass face and great <sighs> mm-hmm. bass body, yeah. which I think is a new era. What is it to, to be able to embody those words and kind of like how does it take your music to kind of like both from the intangible and the tangible parts of words and then a feeling? That's such a good question. Um, t- f- let me just answer for you. Sure. No, I'm just uh, <laughs> To me, it's like, you know, you go through music, you learn all this garbage. I studied so much shit, and especially this project, like, music, so much of it is just magical. It makes you move in a way, and most people don't know, like, that's an A or that's a B. And to think about it is kind of dumb, too, you know? So this is more like everything goes in, you learn all your stuff, and then... Just do it, whatever feels good at the time. And you'll know, like, it's not just dancing. I'm actually, I can't sing very well at all. But I, I do the, um, I do the, like, Oscar Peterson. I don't know if you ever, if you ever listen to Oscar Peterson. It's like, you know, he's a jazz piano player. And he's, uh, he sings along with his piano. And he sings all crazy. So it's like, it's this most unbelievable piano solo you've ever heard. And he's going like, <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm doing that also. So you're like, you're like, Backup yelling. I'm backup yelling. <laughs> I'm bass facing. I'm body bass, body bass, basing. Body basing. That's a lot. That's a and you're just singing, huh? I'm Get to work. Singing, yeah, you know? yeah. I'm just I'm just grooving. Five checks for me, one for him. <laughs> Ten for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and when you're when you're making this music, you know, it's so easy for the lyrics to kind of be throw away or just kind of repetition. How do you match it? And you know, what are you saying within the music that that you know? compliments the uh, backup yelling <laughs> <laughs> um we spend time on our lyrics uh, no we, obviously no it's very <laughs> obvious th- that yeah, was a compliment very, i know yes, yeah very, thank, thank it you might, so much. that might have not come out as a compliment but it, yeah. it was right <laughs> no, I, no. Think, I think we know that it could easily turn into that and yep. so we try to be at least a little real and smart with the lyrics and then <sighs> yeah. usually you know I've had a fun night and I come in and I'm just speaking gibberish and then Cheever just turns it into English. Yeah. Very helpful. You know, what's one of the, we have one song that's that never saw the light of day. That's called marshmallow. I shouldn't even give it away. Cause someone's going to just steal it and make it a song. They owe us money already. And, and, uh, 
it was it was late in Paris, and our friend who's um, at the time pretty ESL um, guy from Brussels, and we're and we we're like get messed up, and we're like let's go just jam, let's go make a beat. So they make a beat that's really slow and drunk, <laughs> and the hook just goes marshmallow, marshmallow, marshmallow. So oh, nice, so <laughs> nice. And it was the fucking jam. Like it was really good. Yeah. So it's maybe not not out yet. Yeah. Coming, coming. It's you just sang the know chorus who and then it back makes in. Sense for someone, someone, someone's gonna someone. use it. Yeah. Everyone we, loves marshmallows. <laughs> can we hear a song? A song. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's do a song. What right. are you going to play for us first? We Dance. We Dance, which um, I don't know if we're going to play later. There's also the remix of this song that's currently storming up the charts. BBC World One, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super mini, super mini remix. Thank you, Ramon. Ramon so good. Lopez. Here we go. Crush Club Live on Snacky Tunes.
I want to talk about the concept of a super mini remix because I've never come across that before. So what is a super mini remix and how much does it differentiate from the original before it goes into a super remix or a mini remix? Please educate. Oh, this is, uh, I wish it was something that we came up. It was actually just somebody's DJ name. (laughs) But, you know, okay, on that note... We have done a super mini, we've done like super mini EP, like where it just has like two seconds of every song and it's so disorienting and, but that's the advertisement for the EP. Um, anyway, yeah, this guy, Ramon, um, forgot his last name. Lopez. Ramon Lopez. Yeah. Um, Australian guy hit us up randomly, found the song, um, you know, please let me remix, and we send him sense. Of course, you know, if anyone. What's crazy is like that, that he yeah. was he was really eager, and I think like now today, when someone's really eager, you kind of like think, "What's up with this person?" Which is pretty screwed <laughs> it's up. It's really cynical, but yeah, I mean, it's but like sad. I know it's because right. before you were just like, "Oh, we're collaborating." Yeah, but now you're like, "What's what's the angle here?" Yeah, what, what's what's the game guy? Are you a real person? Like like are yes. you like a fourteen year old? But is this just some like is Russian this, bot? Is, that, is yeah. this Lashev just like? <laughs> Building Fucking, up confidence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sent this message to myself five years ago, so at the time I'd be like, "Yeah, someone's listening, love it." But it turns out, like, refreshingly, he happens to be someone who just likes music and reaches out to people. Mm-hmm. And I think he had like a remix, like on the Billboard US Dance chart. Like he's like killing it, and uh, he's just super eager and like amazing. When we did remixes and like a million lifetimes ago, right. the last message I spent on sent on MySpace was to Licky Lee to be like a really big fan can you send me the stems for a little bit and she did like Amazing. right before and I was right. like like when you used to be able to be like hey I really like this can we remix it and she's like yeah here you go like that was an earnest time totally. yeah that is a long time right. ago yeah now it's like someone writes you like are you going to hack me and is this a phishing scam yeah are you just going to release the song like yeah. before yeah. it's out right and are you going to like take credit for it and then i have to be like no that's ours yeah. like yeah it's so dark do it people is. do that actually have you heard that someone is like hey let me remix this and they just release it and be like i wrote this song <laughs> That would be That's so awesome. Great that, idea. Yeah. Oh, how do we write this album? We gotta we'll go. never tell. <laughs> we'll never tell. Yeah. Can we hear another song? Yes. Please. What are you yes. gonna play for us this time? What do you want to do, Chi Chi? Let's do trust. Trust. Yes. Yes. What everyone needs a little bit more of. This is the gayest Perfect. crush club song. What to date. <laughs> to date. Yeah. What what makes it the gayest crush club song? Um it just feels like, you know, like dark club, like um. Does that Sexy. equal gay? It equals gay. I mean, have you been to a straight? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I've been to Sorry, I've been I just, everywhere. I'm, it makes me feel like I'm like in a back room, yes. you know, getting my dick sucked. Ooh. Oh, yeah. okay. Here we go on Snacky Tunes. Sloppy? Trust.
You have a DJ residency at Club Coming. S- something so sad has happened. Fun. What has happened? So, I guess like their neighbors or, or something happened where. Um, this is a classic New York tale. Yeah, it's like, like the cabaret license fuck. thing, only it's like the performance license thing. And someone brought it to like the city's attention that they mm-hmm. didn't have a license for DJs or live performances. And so for the time being, they are shut down just for live stuff. They're still open. But yeah, they any DJ or, or like uh, live show nights have been indefinitely postponed. That said... The the residency there has been so fun yeah. Can, for for the uninitiated, yeah, and my parents, yeah. Yes. What is Club Coming? Club Coming is Eastern Block back. It's Eastern Block 2.0. So Eastern Block was a gay bar in the East Village that went off when I was in college. Super sexy, fun, you know, stripper poles, go go dancers, and then it kind of mm. got lame. And then as, Alan as Cumming, things, as things do, as things do, which is fine. And they were going to shut down, but then mm-hmm. Alan Cumming bought it, and then turned it into Club Cumming, which originated from his dressing room when he was on Broadway. He used to turn it into Club Cumming and made a little sign for it, and that's where it started. Is that true? That is very true. Ah, yes. I'm just here to. Was fill that in. during Cabaret? Uh, yes, I'm just here to fill in the facts. Thank yes, it was during, you. To, so it's like he would invite people back, and then that was Club Cumming, and someone made a sign, and then. Like cabaret closed, and they're like, "Let's keep this going," ah. and that's where the idea originated from. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I love Alan Cumming; he's the best. Um, also, like the only way you could get away with a ton of press with that name and be like, "Yeah, well, that's his last name." Yeah. <laughs> Say what you will. Say what you will. <laughs> I that's his I last. Don't I don't know what yeah. you're saying, but that's his last name. Just come. I inside. think a lot of people <laughs> inside are taking it for face value. <laughs> yeah. You mean on the face value? On the face. Yes, value. all <laughs> over the face, in the mouth. But I mean, that is that is the thing about New York, where it is like something is so good, and a lot of people have a good time, and then there's one. I won't. I won't name the bar, but it's a well-known story about this uh, bar um, that used to have this like ex DIY punk rock kid turned lawyer who then like system like systematically got them to roll back their hours. Yeah. And it's like one person who moved in above a bar and then was upset that they moved in above a bar right. and then like kind of ruined it for everyone else. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, that's, that's exactly what's going on here. It's so crazy to me when people move to a city into a musical neighborhood mm-hmm. and then a young expect neighborhood. that it'll be nice and quiet for them. Right. Yeah, I don't understand. Right. It it's, will be in seven years. Just yeah. put in the time. I, I feel like <laughs> I just Wait feel that more. there's a social contract that you enter by coming, especially to New York. I mean, to other right. people, but by coming to New York, like, oh, it's loud. How are you surprised? Uh, right. Like, what did you actually want? Crazy. What did you want out of this city? Right. That's at all. Right. And then it's like, oh, here's a lot of people and a lot of people who can be marginalized or mm-hmm. not celebrated or pushing quarter who are just like living their lives. Right. And like, you know what? I don't like this. This represents everything I don't like, so I'm going to stop this. Right. Yeah. I wonder if um, I wonder if Alan Cumming is going to go to court over this. He's they got made a lot of, it he's seem got a like lot of, it was very like, oh, we just it's paperwork that we like missed, and like it, it'll be solved in ver- like ten days, or like two weeks. <laughs> and you like know what? Two years. The way they make shit happen, I kind of believe them. And Alan right. Cumming is kind yeah. of like. He's gonna get. He's, he's gonna like get a it lord. Yeah. Of, he's like you know a god in New York, and I feel like he's gonna make it happen. And they made a good point. That's like this is a cultural hub. Yeah. Like if you shut this down, you're like silencing people. Yeah, and I think that's true. And I and I don't disagree with that. I mean, Man. honestly, it's like that's where cabaret cabaret laws came from. It was to stop black people from dancing. I mean, it's right. like full right. stop. That's what it is. Yeah. I mean, like like look at all these people who are different, having a good time. Like we can't do racist stuff, so shut we'll be down. like, oh, shut it down. But like, I mean, we all went out. Like I, we danced, we spent our entire twenties and early thirties dancing. No one came and stopped it. That law got right. repealed six months ago. Right. It wasn't our parties that were getting shut down. I was so confused when I heard it was still a law. Right. Cause I was because like, oh. it was there for the use of that or for things like right. things like this. It's interesting right. cause New York is starting um, a nightlife task force too. like, and they've shown that like nightlife mm-hmm. and this type of culture actually benefits the city and mass It like, does oh, it on right. whole and it shows like it oh, brings right. people it brings ideas together it like right. breaks down bears so yeah. then to do this for that's super public too yeah huh did they shame who the neighbor is 
you know, I, I think I might, I don't know if I'm making the neighbor up, but it felt like someone made it like known to the powers that be that, that this was happening and then they got shut down. Like, so I, I'm sure no one that actually goes to that bar, like, you know, yeah. or works at that bar or like is around that bar, like would ever bring attention to unless, this. So unless someone got bounced, they're like, okay, fine. They got, I'm dro- sure it's the person that pays $4,000 <laughs> for the one bedroom apartment right. above the bar or who someone, wanted Eastern block to close and helped to close. Or Oof. someone got drunk and was like, I'll show them. And like drunk child three, one, one. And we're like, who did I call <laughs> right. last night? Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening. Who oh, would do no. this? I'm sorry, Amanda Lepore. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no I want to make sure you have an upcoming EP May, yes. May-ish? It's an ish. An ish. Yeah. Sometime this year-ish. Yeah, definitely. What, what can we expect on the upcoming EP? You'll hear two of these songs that we're playing today. Okay. We Dance and Trust. Um, Three more unbelievable perfect songs yes <laughs> with non-standard lyrics <laughs> that will touch the soul but also shoot from the head yeah. yes. yes you think after <laughs> yes when you're humming it in the shower you go yeah. i do feel that way and i do want to be free i do want to be free you yes. know what I, I like it I'm, i don't take it for granted i don't i like freedom so this year ish stay tuned stay tuned stay tuned yeah Okay. Well, I want to make sure we have time for one more song. Uh, where can people find you? Listen to your mini mix that is super mini super mix. mix. Climbing up the charts. <laughs> yeah. Where can people Storming find you? Storming up the charts right now. Um, so the super mini remix will be out in the next couple weeks on Tinted Records, which is an Australian dance label. And then the rest of our stuff that's released is on Spotify, SoundCloud, you know. YouTube. It's stuff. it's a miracle if you actually look up Crush Club Vowels in uh you'll find us. You will also find the like 2008 Teenage Nightclub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so uh, cool. Where I was like w- what I was do I was like, "Oh, okay, so I found a very certain amount of time in New York and Crush Club." <laughs> it's cool. We're going to leave it on that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. What's the name of the last song you're going to play for us? It's the first get song we off. made. Yeah, yeah it's the first get me song. off. Yeah, first time we made, um, and it was a real great, like, you know, sometimes you make a tune, received well, everyone's like, yes, energy's right, and this this is the whole project just kickstarted. It was, felt great, and that it was a reason for everything. Perfect. Well, thanks for listening this week. Um, we appreciate you coming by. Thanks, thanks for letting me harass you uh, for a year <laughs> to come on the show. Oh. When the time is right, the time is right. Yes. You know? Shout out to everyone. Thanks for tuning in this week. We will be back next week with a new episode of Snacky Tunes. Take it away.
This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.